Robbing Foundation Africa has offices in Lagos, in Abuja, and in Ilora and Inquiry State. But we work in Lagos State in Nigeria, in the Federal Capital Territory of Abuja, in Kwara State, and we also have some smaller programs in Oshun State and Ogun State. And then we have a very big program in Kaduna State. I started the Wellbeing Foundation Africa because I wanted to stop deaths in childbirths in Nigeria. I narrowly missed being a statistic myself 27 years ago and I promised God actually that I would try to save lives by preserving the lives of pregnant women where I could. The Wellbeing Foundation largely works through midwives. Midwives are the way in which we can reach mothers on a regular basis and not only can we reach the mothers, the midwives also bring the knowledge back from the mothers that help us to shape our programs. At the moment we have several programs. The first program and the one that is closest to my heart is the Mamacare program. Mamacare midwives from the foundation attend hospitals across the nation and they give free lessons to pregnant women in what to expect in their body what not to expect so that the pregnant woman becomes an agent of her own outcome and transformational change. And also they tell women the quality of care that they should be getting from their caregivers. We do this through a variety of means. We sing, we dance, we talk, we teach, and we also use anatomical models so that the woman actually has a very good idea of what's going on inside her body. What we find from Mamacare is that first of all, it has helped us to reach the WHO standard because the women are wanting to come for our lessons and we only hold our lessons in hospital facilities. So they actually get the eight antenatal visits that are recommended for low and middle income countries. So far we've reached over 240,000 Nigerian mothers and we haven't lost any to death. The national statistic today is one in 14 Nigerian women will die in childbirth. And when you consider that Mamacare has reached over 240,000 women and none of our mothers have died, it begins to show you that the knowledge of the mother is a very key factor in her survival as well as the training of the health worker that's attending to her. Yeah, as we can see, your work uh, has a great impact, but how sustainable is it? And uh, the women, should we expect also the foundation working outside Nigeria? Because now you've just mentioned some of the places and uh, they're mostly in Nigeria. You know, so far the foundation has been self-funded. But what helps us take our programs to scale is that quite often I will invest in a program. So for instance, on training with anatomical models. I first received a donation of just one suitcase of anatomical models. And I decided to put them to good use and begin to train health workers and train mothers. When I saw the result, I went back to my donors and I said, look, from one suitcase, we have reached X number of communities and this is what it's doing. And actually that became sustainable because the original donor decided to make a program around it, which could be taken to scale in one state. That program is now called EMOG. It's the Emergency Management of Obstetric and Newborn Care. And we have now been able to reach 66,000 health workers and facilities in 16 local government areas in one state. So when you have a program that is well designed and you keep your data and the data is authentic and it's credible and properly costed, it can be adopted by larger bilaterals which take it to scale. Now for the sustainability, every program I do depends on the transference of knowledge. So it doesn't matter whether I'm bringing that knowledge from the community upwards to the bilateral or I'm taking the knowledge from the bilateral downwards. We all learn and because we're all learning as part of it and we're transferring that knowledge between ourselves, we're building community ownership of that program. So at the community level, we're already transferring those skills. They are owning that program. And the idea is that four or five years later, we should be able to walk away from it as the bridge or the facilitator, but the program should continue and the skills should continue to be replicated. And then at the other end as well, at the donor end, just the fact that we're so good about bringing back the monitoring and evaluation data, it also helps that donor to sustain their reason for giving because they're seeing the impact in 
what the program has achieved. I personally think that as so long as the problem exists, the program is sustainable. So I would hope that one day the problem no longer exists. Yeah, one day eventually. And uh, we see that the conversation happening here is of great urgency. But, um, well, looking back in the previous years, so much has improved in the health sector here on the continent. But what more should be done? And how can we move from having conversations to actually having solutions that affect women on the ground? You know, I think if we look at the health sector in individual um, aspects, we've seen a lot of improvement. But if we look at the health sector across the board, we see that these improvements are not necessarily sustained. They're not growing as fast as we can. And sometimes we need to retrace our steps. For instance, that is what took me back to looking at primary health care and to looking at WASH. I saw that we were having epidemics in Africa and we were not stopping those epidemics in their tracks despite all the knowledge that we had. And so I was retracing our steps and I discovered that for instance in Nigeria, we have had a decline in water coverage and water and sanitation hygiene coverage from 35%, which wasn't good enough. We have now gone back to 22%. So it wasn't surprising that cholera came and started to grow. Measles came and started to grow. So I think what we need to do as Africans is never to relax that, oh, we did this. If I look at family planning, that one is an explosion waiting to happen. And that is not because we don't know about family planning. It's because the supply chain of family planning is not as strong as it should be. And so people know what they're supposed to have, but they're not getting it at the time that they need it. The sales in Nigeria of the morning after pill outstrip the sales of regular contraceptives. And that tells us that something is wrong. If people are only accessing tools at the point of emergency, as opposed to accessing tools all the time, the prevention being better than cure, our job's not finished yet. We still have a lot to do.